Well, hello everyone and welcome to First Tuesdays. First Tuesdays is a monthly webinar offered by the Washington State Library. And um, we'll let you know that we are going to record this so that if you have to leave a little bit early, you can go ahead and um, later this afternoon, it will be on the Washington State Library training site. You can go back and listen to the whole thing again or finish it if you need to. First, I have a bit of business that I need to attend to um, before I turn you over to our presenter today. Um, I am your facilitator. My name is Tammy Masonheimer. I'm the training coordinator here. This is my contact information. And today, Jeremy Stroud is here for technical support. And Jeremy, can you can please put your contact info into the chat in case someone needs your help a little bit later? That's usually the best way to get hold of them. Okay, so, um, First Tuesday is brought to you by the Washington State Library, which is part of the Office of Secretary of State. Our funder is the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the LSTA Act, and we're grateful to them for our funding. And we ask that you do take a short sur four question survey that will appear when you close the window at the end of the presentation today. And this is important information that we use in our annual report so we can continue funding for training such as this. And we thank you in advance for your feedback on that. And today we have a great presentation, perfect timing for November for to hear about kindness and gratitude. I want to thank um, David Seckman for taking the time to present today. And he has a, he will take questions if you type him into chat, then we'll give them to the um, give them to him at the ends for things that he, that you may have questions about. So a little bit about David. He is a senior librarian at the Pierce County Library System. He's been researching and speaking about the effects of kindness and gratitude on well-being and relationships for over 10 years. And David has over 10 years of experience as a library manager, and he puts these theories that he's going to talk about today into practice on a daily basis. So go ahead and take it away, David. Hey, thank you, Tammy, and thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedule to um, speak today and listen to what I have to say and uh, learn a little bit more about kindness and gratitude. And thank you for the state for the opportunity. It's definitely one of my favorite topics for sure. So I'm going to launch my presentation here. Excellent. So you might be wondering how I became interested in kindness and gratitude. Well, it really started about a dozen years ago or so when I was working down in sunny Miami, Florida. I was working for the Miami-Dade Public Library System in charge of a book club discussion group. Now, sometimes I picked the book we were going to read, and other times our customer picked which, which book we were going to read. Now, this particular time, a customer picked a book for our book club. It was called Stumbling on Happiness by Daniel Gilbert. Now, Gilbert's a professor of psychology at Harvard. He tells us that the things that we think will make us happy, such as money, power, and prestige, turn out not to make us very happy at all, whereas things such as social connections and relationships are what really make us happy. Now, at the time, I hadn't really given happiness much thought. I just thought, eh, some people are happier than others, and that's life. Some people seem pretty happy-go-lucky most of the time, while others seem pretty miserable most of the time. But then there are some folks who fall in the middle, which I think are most of us. So I have a poll question for you. What percentage of our happiness is based on heredity? Is it A, 10%, B, 50%, or C, 40%? I'll let you take a few moments and do our poll. So what do you think, Jeremy? Do we have results? It looks like they're still settling a little bit. Oh, no worries. 80% 80, 80 have returned. Nice. Okay, it looks like it's settled down now. All right. So, so it looks like we have 46% 46 said 10%. 24% said 50%, and 
and and uh, twenty nine percent said forty percent. Thank you for that. Now let's see what is our answer. Let's see, my PowerPoint is stuck. Let's see. Uh, make sure you click on the PowerPoint again. The poll might have had the focus for a moment. Oh, gotcha. Let's try that. Oh, there it goes. Thank you, Jeremy. It's good to have technical support. We're very grateful for that. So the answer is B, 50%. Now this made some sense to me um, from what I'd known anecdotally over the years. Uh, but something that did surprise me was that only 10% of our happiness depends on life situation. So if you win a million dollars or get struck by lightning and live to tell the tale, your happiness level kind of evens out and goes back to its original level that you were at before your windfall or catastrophe. Psychologists call this baseline of happiness your happiness set point, which is pretty interesting. So you'll see from the slide here, we have this gentleman who run what they call the hedonic treadmill, which basically means that even after the um, trying for more wealth, more material possessions, and even as you accumulate more wealth and more material possessions, it doesn't make you any happier because what you expect, what you feel entitled to increases. So the happiness level, even with accumulating wealth and possessions, doesn't really um, go up. Now you see that over on the right, the happiness baseline or happiness set point, even during um, life situation, things such as winning the lottery, it jumps up briefly and then pops back down after about a year or two at set point. And the same if one was to be paralyzed, it, you have a very lowering of your overall happiness, but then it goes back up to the set point. So it's very interesting. Now these two statistics taken together uh, could be viewed as fairly bleak, except for the other 40% of our happiness depends on the conscious choices we make every day to be happier. So you'll see from my PowerPoint here that kindness and gratitude help break through the happiness set point. You see that we have the 50% is genetic, 10% being life situation, and 40% depending on the conscious choices we make every day to be happier. And this is what gets me excited about kindness and gratitude. Because in every research study I've ever seen, kindness and gratitude are at the top or near the top of the list in terms of living a happier life. And you can see how this is true because as we break through the happiness set point by focusing on what's going right in our life, then we discover there's more and more things to be happy about that doesn't necessarily relate to the material possessions. And the same with stepping off the hedonic treadmill, because when you do kind deeds for others, when you realize that there's things larger than yourself, then you're able to step off the hedonic treadmill. And as you see, it's all about relationships. Now, the great thing is research also tells us that kindness and gratitude are keys to creating dynamic teams, stronger relationships, and outstanding customer loyalty. These are key ingredients to making this happen. Now, I love this because kindness and gratitude are seen as ideals to be aspired to in almost all civilizations. Almost all societies view kindness and gratitude as ideals to be aspired to. So what else do you know in life that's a win for your personal happiness, your relationships, and the world at large? Now, I say the world at large because those who witness or even hear about your kind and grateful acts are much more likely to be kind and grateful themselves. Now, today we're going to take a look at some techniques and strategies that will help you cultivate more kindness and gratitude in your life, as well as in your relationships. But before we go into those techniques, let's briefly review what science has to say about kindness and gratitude. Now, there's been over 40 research studies on the effects of gratitude, and there's been over 31 benefits of gratitude that gratitude has on our lives. Now, I'm not going to go through all 31 of those with you today, but I would suggest you go back and review these slides later on. You'll see gratitude affects our emotional well-being, our social well-being, our career health, and our health, not to mention our personality. 
but I did want to go over some of the highlights for you today. People who practice more gratitude, people who go out of their way to practice more gratitude, showing an increase in enthusiasm towards life, more progress toward their personal goals, less symptoms of illness and depression. They have more energy. And in one study, they even exercise more. They average 40 more minutes of exercise per week compared to those who are not practicing these gratitude interventions. Now, what gets me really excited about this is more recent research gratitude that looks at fMRI technology. That's functional magnetic resonance imaging technology. Say that five times fast, which basically measures the blood flow in the brain. And so when people are experiencing happiness, they see areas light up in the brain as associated with empathy, compassion, and happiness. Not only that, but dopamine and serotonin is released as well, which will make us want to perform more grateful acts and be more grateful. Now, for me, seeing is believing. And when you can actually see physiological changes in the brain associated with gratitude, this is very encouraging. Now, you can say the same thing about kindness as well, because kindness, you can also measure physiological changes in the brain and the body as well. For example, many research studies, they document changes in the brain associated with hormone levels of oxy, oxytocin. Now, that's the hormone commonly connected to bonding. It's that warm and fuzzy feeling you feel when you receive a hug from a loved one. Oxytocin has also been shown to have a calming effect on lower blood pressure. Now, this makes sense because when you're, when you're feeling close to a loved one, uh, it is, does have a calming effect. So you can kind of see how it would lower blood pressure. Now, some people talk about experiencing a helper's high, doing a kind deed. Now, these are endorphins being released, which make us feel good as well. Not only that, but endorphins are a natural painkiller, which is quite interesting, I think. And one study even showed people 55 years or older who volunteered for two or more organizations a week experienced a 44% less chance of death from any cause as those who did not, which I thought was pretty fascinating. And that adjusted for exercise and smoking as well. Now, as you see on your screen, kindness can be learned. Um, not everybody is born kind, but as we practice kindness and we see the benefits of kindness, not only do we feel better, but others respond to us better as well. So you can see how kindness can be something that we will want to do more of the more we do it. I mentioned kindness being contagious as well. Now I have a handy video. It's about two minutes you'll see on the Life Fest Inside link there. I'm not going to show it to you today, um, but I would like to encourage you to go back and watch it. It's worth watching. It's like a two minute video. And it's got some really interesting factoids in there that you might, you might like. Now that's a little about what science has to say about kindness and gratitude. Let's switch gears for a moment and talk about how kindness and gratitude can help transform our workplace culture and even improve our relationships while we're at it. Now the key to success in transforming workplace culture and creating, dy creating dynamic teams is something I like to refer to as kind communication. Now, I would define kind communication as communication that mostly focuses on strengths, both the strengths of the individual and the strengths of the organization. It's about celebrating those strengths and leveraging those strengths in order to grow those strengths. It looks for opportunities to catch someone doing something right and recognizing those achievements. Now, is this to say that kind communication ignores problems? Absolutely not. If the ship's going down, you have to let people know. It's not about ignoring problems. Now, is kind communication doormat communication? It's not. You have to hold folks accountable for their behavior. If you don't, you're not being kind to yourself, you're not being kind to your organization, and you're not being kind to the person who's doing whatever it is they're doing that's annoying you. Now, because they might not even realize what they're doing is wrong. You mean I'm not supposed to water the plants eight times a day? Who knew? And people really might not have any idea. Now, kind communication is not about 
never saying anything negative. It's about the ratio of positive to negative. You want to have many more positive comments than negative comments. And it's not necessarily always what you say, it's how you say it that's crucial. Now, I would also define kind communication as respectful communication. It's a start to treat people how you want to be treated, but find out how they want to be treated as well and go from there. Now, finally, kind communication is fun communication. We're with the people we work with more often than we're with our friends and family most of the time. So why not create a sense of joy and laughter in the workplace? The world's most successful companies know that if you create a space for laughter then kind and kindness, a space for fun to flourish, then innovation and creativity will flourish as well. So these are very key points. I can't emphasize that enough. People learn more when they're having fun. Now there's two reasons that kind communication is so crucial to a successful workplace. Number one is the fact that our emotions are contagious. We're like little Wi-Fi networks walking around. We can't help but be affected by the emotions of those around us. Now you can always, you can probably picture a time when things were going well. And then all of a sudden, wah, 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 in walks Debbie Downer. And it's like a dark cloud entering the area. This person always has some kind of problem with someone or something. Now I'm not saying we shouldn't be empathetic towards people. That's part of what kindness is all about. All I'm saying is that our emotions are contagious and we have to be mindful of how our emotions are affecting others and how others' emotions are affecting us. Sometimes we have to be straight up with people and tell them the impact they're having on us and our organizations. Now the opposite is also true. Picture what happens to the energy and emotions of people when that person walks in the room and they light up the room with their smile. That person with a magnetic personality. Now I'm not saying you have to be that person. I'm just saying to be the best version of yourself. We can make a huge difference in the success of our organizations by how we treat each other on a minute by minute basis. Speaking of smiling, the Ritz Carlton hotel chain came up with something several years ago called the 10 5 way, which basically means you're 10 feet or less from a customer or coworker, you need to smile and make eye contact. If you're five feet or less, you need to make, you need to smile, make eye contact and give some sort of greeting. Hello, how's it going? Or something like that. Now your first response might be, that's kind of dumb. I don't want my employer telling me I have to smile. But the thing is, most people, I'd say 99 out of 100 times when you smile at somebody, they smile back. Because like our emotions, smiling is contagious. Not only that, but when we smile, those feel-good chemicals of dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins are released. So not only do our customers and coworkers feel good, but we feel good as well. Now, this is not something we have to force on people because it's contagious. It feels good and becomes a social norm. Smiling and greeting someone seems so basic, but do we always do it? Start going out of your way to smile and greet your customers and coworkers, even those who you sometimes avoid or have issues with. And see if this doesn't have a real positive impact on your relationships. Now, another reason that kind communication is so crucial to our success is something called the negativity bias. That's a pretty frowny face, huh? Now, the negativity bias is another one of those $2 psychological terms that basically means that the negative emotions tend to hold more weight than the positive emotions. They last longer and affect us stronger than the positive emotions. If you think of the negative emotions as like glue, they tend to stick to us, while the positive emotions are more like Teflon and tend to bounce off of us. Now, why do you think this is so? Well, one could argue that if you go back to the dawn of humans, we might be able to find some answers there. Now, the world was a much more dangerous time back then than it is today, contrary to what you might hear on the news. Now, for one, humans were not the number one predators walking the earth, and there was a good chance that one could get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or some other large predator. There was an even more likely chance 
that you might get clubbed in the back of the head by a roaming band of humans. One in ten died from warfare back then. So the human mind has been conditioned over eons to always be on the lookout for threats. Now this makes sense because if you make a mistake on a threat, then you might not live to tell the tale. But if you if you see a false positive, a false threat, then it's not that big of a deal. It's like, oh, that wasn't a tiger in the bushes. Whereas if you miss out on that tiger, then you probably won't live to tell the tale. Now, conversely, if you miss out on a positive experience, you're more likely to catch another positive experience some other time. Now, this threat of danger helps explain why the experiences stay with us for so much longer. It's the mind's way of protecting us. Not only that, but the brain can't really tell the difference between a physical and an emotional threat. The same physiological processes occur in each one. Now, we do live in a much safer world than our ancestors, but we haven't adapted to those changes in culture. Our society today rewards innovation and creativity. And it's very difficult to be creative and innovative while in the negative mindset. When we're in the negative frame of mind, it literally, and I do mean this literally, narrows our perspective. Whereas when we're experiencing the positive emotions, we can literally see more clearly, including making connections that we might not have normally thought of, or even opportunities that have always been there and we just missed out on them. Now, the thing is, the neutral mind says the same way. So we want to create as much positivity as we can because negativity affects us so much more strongly. We need to have many more positive experiences and interactions than negative ones in order, in order to counteract its strength. Now, Marcial Lasada, he's an organizational psychologist. He noticed this phenomenon when observing various teams in the workplace. He noticed that teams that had a higher ratio of positive to negative comments had much more success working together. They were much more profitable, their quality and quantity of work was better, and they were more creative and innovative. Lasada tells us that we need at least three positive comments to counteract just one negative comment. He says, optimally, we should have six positive comments for every one negative comment. Now, I don't want you to get all caught up in this ratio and spend all your time counting positive comments or that you won't give someone a negative comment until you've given them their three positive comments. For one thing, when you're giving somebody positive comments, they have to be real. They have to be authentic. Otherwise, people will see right through it. You have to really mean it. And also, you just need to be mindful that you need to have many more positive comments than negative comments in communicating with your teams. If you want to create a team that is flourishing, so it needs to be authentic, but it, you need to take the time to make that happen. I would also make the same argument about taking the time to celebrate team successes. This is very crucial because it's so easy to complete a team project or initiative and then just jump right into the next project or initiative without even taking the time to celebrate what's just been completed. Now, this doesn't have to be elaborate, but it's important to take the time and say how awesome we are. Now, you still want to build in time to talk about opportunities for improvement, but celebrating team successes will strengthen morale as your team will feel appreciated and not only an integral part of the team, but an integral part of your organization. Celebrating successes will prime your team for future success and guard against burnout, while at the same time build resiliency against setbacks that will inevitably occur. And I think this is really crucial. Oh, that's my cat. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think that's really crucial because, you know, you need to build up those positive experiences in your memory bank. And for supervisors, it's a great idea to review, you know, the successes you've had for the year and you can write them down and go over them on a pretty regular basis because it's easy to forget those things. You know, keep in mind the negativity bias. So it's it's very important that we go over those on a regular basis. Now, a lot of you, beans were in Washington, have probably heard of uh, Dr. John Gottman. 
you know, he's from, he's a professor at the um, University of Washington, and he's studied marital interactions for over 40 years now. And he will tell you that you need at least five positive comments or experiences to counteract just one negative comment or experience. Experience in your personal relationships, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, he's, he can tell with 93% accuracy whether a couple's headed for happiness ever after, happily ever after, or um, divorce court within just a few minutes of seeing them interact. And that has a lot to do with the positive uh, to negative comments in a nutshell. I think this is interesting because, you know, Lasada saying we need three positive comments to counteract just one negative comment, and um, and Gottman saying we need five positive comments. Now this makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, you know, we, you know, for lack of a better word, we take these personal relationships personally. We're used to criticism at work, and we sometimes we expect a little bit, but not as much in our personal lives. So it, we feel it much more in our personal lives because we can't always choose who we spend time with at work, um, but hopefully we have a little more say in who we spend time with in our personal lives. So you can see why those negative comments and experiences are, they're so much more destructive in our personal lives. Now I'll let you chew on that for a while, but let's get back to the workplace for the moment. Now what is the key to dynamic teams? That's an excellent question. And a few years ago, Google set out to answer that question. They're trying to figure out what traits make successful teams. And for a while, they were stumped. They couldn't figure out why teams who looked almost identical on paper could create such different results. They looked at criteria such as IQ, grade point average in college, and experience in the field, and nothing seemed to stand out as the master predictor of success in creating successful teams. Now, of course, for Google, for Google, a successful team would be defined as a team that was not only profitable, but innovative, creativity, and their quality and quality was outstanding. Finally, they were able to isolate the number one predictor of success in teams. The number one predictor of success for a team, are you ready, is the degree of psychological safety that team members had. Now, the official definition of psychological safety, as you can see, is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. Sounds a bit like being respectful, right? And I believe this is especially true when people have comfort in expressing their ideas to the group. I would argue this is especially crucial and key when expressing new ideas. This makes total sense, right? Think about a time when you're at some kind of meeting and someone had a bright idea and they couldn't wait to express it to the group only to have it shot down or ridiculed on the spot by a supervisor or team member. Now, what did that do to the energy in the room when that happened? Is anyone gonna have any more bright ideas? Probably not for a long time. Now this goes back again to what I was saying about kind communication being about respectful communication. In order to create the conditions for fantastic teams, you treat everyone's ideas with an open mind and respect. Now Facebook takes this concept of psychological safety to the extreme during their hackathon of events. About once a quarter, they since their inception, they've been doing this, um, they get folks from work after hours and it's on a voluntary basis. They pitch their new ideas to each other. Now, the only rule is these ideas can only exist in their head. They cannot, they cannot be an approved idea already in the pipeline of development. Team members pitch their ideas and hopefully the best ideas rise to the top. Now, Facebook will admit that most of these ideas proposed are pretty dumb, but there are those multi-million and billion dollar ideas that get discovered. Facebook Live, for example, is a result of a hackathon. So now, so far we've talked about focusing mostly on people's strengths, having mostly positive, respectful interactions, and bringing a sense of joy and fun to the workplace. But there will be times, however, when we need to hold folks accountable for their behavior or tell people what they don't want to hear. Now, in doing so, one of our primary objectives will be to keep people from becoming defensive. 
the reason we care about this is when people become defensive, they go into fight or flight mode because the brain can't really tell the difference between a physical threat or an emotional threat. When people get defensive, the blood flow that's usually reserved for the vital organs goes rushing to the arms and legs in order to properly prepare for fight or flight. This directly affects the functioning of the cerebral cortex that acts as the executive function of the brain. Just when people need the rational brain the most, it goes temporar temporarily offline to get ready for fight or flight. And we can help people avoid defensiveness by choosing our words wisely. One of my favorite phrases for helping people avoid defensiveness is, you might not realize this, but you might not realize this, but you smell like urine, and I'm going to have to ask you to clean yourself up before you can come back to the library. Thank you. I've actually used that quite a few times to great effect. You might not realize this, but this is a non-smoking campus. I'm going to have to ask you to put your cigarette out. Thank you. Now, what you're doing there is you're giving people a way out with dignity. You're giving them an opportunity to save face, and they're not feeling directly challenged. And I can't overemphasize this enough. The great lengths people will go to save face. I mean, people have fought wars over this. So it's very important that we, you give people a way out with dignity. Now, you can actually flip the phrase. There's many different ways you can do this, especially for a coworker, for example. And you can say, you probably already know this. You probably already know this, but I found this great workaround in Microsoft Excel yesterday. It saved me a ton of time on my work. It saved me hours. Do you mind if I show it to you? So see how you kind of flip that phrase because you don't want to come off like a know-it-all. You want to assume, hey, this person's confident and competent. They know what they're doing because people don't want to feel like, like they don't know what they're doing. So it's very crucial. Now, my coworker, I was talking to her last night. It's pretty interesting. Uh, she was telling me about an interaction she had with a little girl at the library the other day. And the little girl had come in, and she's basically like, hey, you want to buy a candy bar? And my coworker's first response was, uh, you know, there's no soliciting in the library. And as she said this, she could actually see the little girl's face drop, like just, you know, went really into that sort of negative zone. And then she, but then my coworker sort of caught herself and said, you probably didn't know that, did you? And she could actually see the little girl perk up and, and get back to normal. So it's really interesting um, using these phrases, how it really lowers defensiveness. Now I've seen this work in a lot of different settings for a lot of different kinds of people. And I did include in your handouts uh, a worksheet that offers these phrases uh, to help people avoid defensiveness. So you want to work the, through these with a partner when you need a chance. Uh, we won't have time to do it today, but I would really encourage you to do so. And think about a time when these phrases would have come in handy in a real life situation. And I, like I said, I would love to know some of your stories about this because these have worked uh, with all kinds of people in all kinds of situ situations. So please give me give me a shout out about this if you have any questions about it as well. So it's really pretty pretty fascinating. So gears and talk about some of the techniques that we use to cultivate more feelings of kindness and gratitude in our lives which will help translate into more kind and grateful actions towards ourselves and towards others. Now, the first technique I want to talk about is something you've probably heard of before, popularized by Oprah Winfrey in the late 1990s and studied relentlessly by Dr. Robert Emons from the University of California, Davis. Now, if you take a look at my slide here concerning happiness increase and time, one is practice writing in a gratitude journal, you'll notice that people don't tend to experience a huge increase in happiness when they first start writing in a gratitude journal. But over time, people's happiness level seems to increase substantially. By six months, people register a 10% boost in happiness. Some studies suggest writing in a gratitude journal can increase your happiness by up to 25%. Now, why do you think it takes so much time to see that substantial increase in happiness? I would argue that you're literally changing your brain as you take time to seek out what's going right in your life. You remember from earlier, we learned about the negativity bias. 
The mind left to its own devices will seek out problems and is always scanning for threats. If we can train our minds to look for what is going right in our life, we will discover more and more things we have to be grateful for. And we'll discover opportunities that have always been there. Some people say take time out to smell the roses. I would argue that we don't even see the roses in the first place. They're invisible to us. It's like we have blinders on because we're so busy jumping from task to task and topic to topic. We never take the time to be in the here and now and realize all the good things that surround us always. Now, thinking about what you have to be grateful for is great, but the problem with thought is you might be thinking about what you're grateful for, and the next thing you know, you start thinking about what you have to buy at the store, or, oh, no, I forgot to pick up my kids at soccer practice. I got to go. Now, the great thing about the act of writing is it focuses your attention like a laser beam. It's very difficult to be writing about something and at the same time thinking about something else. Now, another great thing about writing is that when you start writing a few sentences about what you're grateful for, you'll discover things that you didn't even realize. It's very, it brings insight. It's things that were just below the conscious level you can write about and say, oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Now, interestingly, I just want to throw this out here. I, I saw this the other day. A coworker sent me an article, a research article, that just came out in 2018. And this is pretty fascinating. It looked at um, the uh, it looked at teens and preteens and materialism, which I thought was pretty interesting. And it wondered that if writing in a gratitude journal would would decrease materialism. And so they had these teens and preteens write a gratitude journal for a couple of weeks, which isn't much time. And not only did it decrease materialism it actually increased generosity which i found this to be fascinating so um they were given real money and they actually gave more money away to charity the folks who'd written in the gratitude journal so i thought this was was pretty interesting i, I thought it was it was pretty cool uh so it kind of goes ties in with that whole hedonic treadmill concept. now back to the, the mechanics of writing in the gratitude journal Dr. Robert Eamons, as I really the preeminent researcher on gratitude, in his book, Gratitude Works, a 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity, talks about best practices for writing in a gratitude journal. Because a lot of people say, oh, you know, I, I've tried a gratitude journal, and I just end up writing the same things over and over again. Well, hopefully these best practices will help you with that. The first one is be specific. Now, this makes sense because... It brings out more variety in what you're writing about. We talk about variety being the spice of life. For example, if you write that you're grateful for your spouse seven days in a row, it might lose some of its effect on you. But if you write more specifically why you're grateful for your spouse, it's like a whole new thing. Also, as I mentioned earlier, when you start to write a few sentences about what you're grateful for, you'll discover you might not have thought about at the conscious level. Now, secondly, Write about something that came as a surprise to you. Psychologists will tell you that there are moments in life that we receive the most intense, emo uh, in excuse me, intense emotions are those times when we're surprised, which is pretty interesting. It includes both positive and negative emotions. So if you've, if you've ever had a boss tell you, you know, I don't really like surprises, there's a reason for that. And it has a much higher emotional effect. Uh, this is probably why we surprise people with presents we don't just say hey i bought you a new bike here it is you kind of want to surprise them a little bit now, number three is scarcity write about something that is not infinite something that has an end point maybe you took a class for example and you had a great time and you learned a lot but it's coming to an end this could be a time for celebration now near misses is one that i added to the list something really bad could have happened to you but it didn't I got pulled over by the police, but I didn't get a ticket. Skiddly doo. Now, if you see your handouts, there's also a handout on writing in the gratitude journal. Now, we won't have time to do it today, but I hope you'll go back and try it. It's pretty powerful. Now, one key is you want to write about five things that you're grateful for. Why five things? Well, it's pretty easy to write about one thing, one or two things. Three or four is a little bit of a stretch, but five things can be quite difficult, 
especially if you're not used to writing in a gratitude journal. You really have to stretch those gratitude muscles, which is exactly what you want to do because you're trying to seek out more and more things in your life that are grateful, you're grateful for. It reveals those things that were invisible to you before. So it's a very powerful practice, the gratitude journal. But don't take my word for it. Try it and see what I mean. It can be very powerful. So now I want to talk about something that's not – oh, I forgot one section. I'm sorry. Um, you, we want to make the gratitude journal a habit because you want to take the path of least resistance with the gratitude journal. That means you want to make it as easy for you as possible to make it a habit. So you want to do it the same day and time each day. That will help you help it become a habit, just another thing that you do. But that being said, on the flip side, you want to make sure that you pick a day and time where you're not feeling rushed. You don't want to just make this another thing on your to-do list. You want to really make it something special, something you look forward to, something that's a treat for you. Now, I myself tend to uh, do it after I put my kids to bed at night. It's a good way to unwind from the day and kind of reflect on the day. It's a, it's a nice, positive way in the day but you know just make it you know what works best for you um people ask well how often should i write in my gratitude journal and i say it's totally up to you now dr emans would say you should write at least every other day now i like to alternate between the gratitude journal and uh, something called the gratitude letter that we'll talk about in a little bit as well as thank you notes because you know variety being the spice of life but that being said you want to pick a notebook you only use for writing in a gratitude journal you don't want to just write it on the back of your grocery list. It kind of loses some of its um, specialness, if you will. So you want to dedicate a journal specifically for writing what you're grateful for in. And you want to make sure that you have a pen or paper uh, permanently attached to your notebook. I know it sounds kind of silly, but you don't want to be wandering around looking for a pen or pencil. Next thing you know, doorbells ringing, dogs barking, cats are meowing, children need something. So it's important that you um, make sure you have that handy so you don't drift off and not end up doing it. So now I want to talk about something that's not quite as well known as the gratitude journal. Uh, now this technique's been around for about 2,500 years. Originally mostly practiced by Buddhist monks. Then about 10 or 15 years ago, neuroscientists and psychologists began to take notice. I'm talking about the loving kindness meditation. Although it sounds quite mystical, the main thing you do during the loving kindness meditation is wish people well. Now, first you start out wishing yourself well, and then the person or being you care most about. I say being because uh, many people feel closest to their pet, so that's why I say being instead of person. Uh, now, the first thing you're trying to do, the important thing you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to generate positive feelings towards someone and then transfer those positive feelings towards an ever-widening circle of living beings. So you'd first start out wishing yourself well, then someone you care about a great deal, next a neutral person that you have neither positive nor negative feelings towards, then someone you're having problems with. Now, that's the one that people have the most issues with. They're like, eh, not that. But yeah, somebody that you're having strife with is a good person to wish well. Eventually, you want to wish every living thing in the world well. Now, this simple practice has been studied by the National Institute of Health, Harvard Medical School, the Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins University, MIT, and UC Berkeley, to name a few. Now, scientists so far have identified over 18 benefits of the loving kindness meditation. Now, I'm not going to go over all 18 of those benefits with you today. I just want you to know that, that it exists, so you might want to do more research on that. But I do want to hit some of the highlights for you that you might find most interesting. Loving kindness meditation has been shown to increase feelings of well-being, including love, joy, awe, contentment, and amusement, to name a few. It increases social connection, which makes sense as you're, wish, you're wishing an ever-widening circle of individuals well. The loving kindness meditation has also been shown to decrease bias towards others. Now, in 2018, I think this is extremely important considering how polarized our country is right now. 
one first step towards healing is to realize we have much more in common than we have differences. Also, when you start thinking of ourselves as we, instead of thinking of ourselves as us and them, think of, think of everyone as we, how we're all interconnected. Now, another benefit of the loving kindness meditation is self-love. Many people are their own worst critics. So wishing yourself well can go a long way towards creating compassion for yourself. Now, it also has immediate and long-term effects. Even practicing the loving kindness meditation once for as little as 10 minutes has been shown to increase positive emotions and feelings of social connection to strangers. Also, people who've been introduced to the loving kindness meditation have continued to show improvements over 15 months, which is pretty awesome. Even 15 months later, if they're on the loving kindness program, maybe for six weeks or so, they still show improvements in their positive emotions even 15 months later, which I think is pretty awesome. Now, Albert Einstein seemed to grasp the human condition pretty accurately when he wrote – a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and his feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And I thought this was really fascinating. I don't think Albert, I have no proof that Albert Einstein did the loving kindness meditation, but I think he really hits the nail on the head in terms of what we're looking for with the loving kindness meditation. Now, I would encourage you to seek out if you're interested, you know, go to YouTube. There's lots of guided meditations on the loving kindness meditation. But I think that it is extremely powerful and can really help turn feelings of us and them into we. So I think that that is super awesome. And I would highly suggest you give it a shot. Now, next up I want to talk about something. It's not quite as well known as either the gratitude journal or the loving kindness meditation. I'm talking about the gratitude letter. The gratitude letter is a lot like what it sounds like. You're going to write a letter for someone who's had a profound impact on your life. It could be someone you see every day or someone you haven't talked to in years. The important thing is that you haven't taken the time to properly, properly thank them for the profound impact they've had on your life. Now, there haven't been too many experiments working with the gratitude letter, but the ones that have been done are quite promising. One experiment done at Indiana University back in 2015 looked at 40 students who'd requested mental health counseling for anxiety and depression. Now, all 40 students received mental health counseling, but 20 of those were asked to come in for an extra 20 minutes ahead of their counseling session on three separate occasions. Now, during that time, the students were instructed to write gratitude letters to someone. All the students were measured three months later using fMRI technology. Those who wrote the gratitude letters showed changes in the brain associated with empathy and compassion compared to those 20 who did not. But wait, there's more. Both groups were given a small amount of money and told that they could keep all of it or give some of it to charity. Now, the people who participated in writing the gratitude letters gave away more money than the group that did not. So let's recap these amazing results for a second. People spent a total of one hour of their lives writing a gratitude letter for someone, and scientists could see measurable changes in their brain activity even three months later. Not only that, but writing a gratitude letter seemed to encourage changes in behavior as well. Now, a similar and much larger study was done at UC Berkeley in 2017 and saw over 400 students participate. And the results were much – they were very similar to the earlier experiments done at Indiana University. So the results are quite promising for the gratitude letter. Now, when you do your gratitude letter, you want to make sure you go through several drafts of the letter because you want to get the language just right. The person's had a profound impact on your life, and you want to make that letter special. Choose your words wisely. 
the more you revise the letter, the letter, the more things you'll remember that the person's done for you in your life that you're thankful about. Now, it might go without saying, but you want to rid the letter of any spelling or grammatical errors. You want to send the letter to them via snail mail and not email or text because it's much more special to get a letter in the mail. When was the last time you got a letter from a real person? not counting a stranger wanting to purchase your house from you. So we're not gonna have time to do the gratitude letter writing today, but but um, there is a worksheet on there with um, explains how to do it. So go back and, and do the gratitude letter. I, I highly recommend it. Now we're getting close to question time here, but I did wanna leave you with a thought that before we open it up for questions. And it was something the Dalai Lama said a, a few years ago. He said that inner peace is indeed achievable, or excuse me, he said world peace is indeed achievable, but it will first come through inner peace, which makes a lot of sense because as we do these practices, as we cultivate more kindness and gratitude through some of these exercises into our hearts and our minds, how it changes our hearts and minds, we start to feel more kind and grateful. Now, when we feel more kind and grateful, that's going to allow us more likelihood to be more kind and grateful. So that's really our challenge, folks, to go out into the world and be kind and grateful every day. So thank you. We're, we're going to open up to questions. And if you did like to contact me, there is ways to contact me with my long email address there, david at kindnessandgratitudeeveryday.com. Quite long, I know. You can also con connect with me on Facebook. It's pretty easy to search kindness and gratitude every day. That's my little group that I have. And you can also visit my webpage at kindnessandgratitudeeveryday.com. Quite long. But yeah, I'd love to open it up to questions and see what you have to have. Hopefully I can answer some questions for you. Okay. Well, this is Tammy. Thank you, David. That was really, really interesting. And right now, I the only question we had, I think you already answered it, was is the point of the gratitude letter to mail it or just the process of writing it? Well, you know, it works. The pro just the process of writing it is, is um, helpful. I mean, it, it's definitely going to help with, the, with your well-being to, to write the letter. Just the mere – that's a great question. Just the mere act of writing it itself, it focus on those positive things. Now, I would suggest that you mail it because you're going to make the person – you know, feel good. But, you know, I've had questions before where people ask, well, you know, what if the person is uh, deceased? Do I, should I still write the letter? I'd say, you know, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the mere process of writing the letter is, is helpful. But, you know, think of the, you know, if you send a gratitude letter to somebody, they're like, wow, I, I wouldn't have thought to do this. Maybe they'll send a gratitude letter to somebody else and it'll make them feel good. So I, I suggest to send it, but if, if you don't feel comfortable, it, it works well not to. Okay. And then Heather is asking, do you have any thoughts on gratitude apps like Grateful for Journaling? Uh, you know, I've never used any of those. I, I think whatever can help, whatever makes it easy for you, because I, I think the whole thing is you want to make it, you know, as seamless and easy for you as possible. Um, so, you know, whatever, you know, technique in the recording it works the best for you, I say go for it. Okay. That, you know, Maybe you can maybe you don't have to worry about carrying a notebook around at lunch, you know, if you want to do it during your lunch break or something. Okay. And then Carolyn said the Calm app is awesome. So are you familiar with that one? I'm not. That sounds promising. <laughs> I'd have to investigate that one. I have to write all these Calm, down. And go out. I'm going to write that down. Calm app. That, that sounds good. Yes. Yes. Very and cool. then um, we have a question from, is it Risa May? When will, will the handouts be available and can we re-listen to this once we have the paperwork to support the lecture? And that is yes. Um, Jeremy is going to be sending out the handouts later this afternoon and the webinar will be posted on the Washington State Library training page under First Tuesdays and it will be there for a very long time so you can go back as often as you want and re-listen and work on the paperwork too. By a very long time, we haven't read <laughs> any of them. 2007 was our first session it's there so nice. very long awesome. <laughs> and then um let's see mara says i'm very grateful for your presentation and plan to pass the recording on to many peeps outside library land oh nice so it says your manner is engaging and endearing in a lovely professional way 
and I hope everyone gets tons of chances to share this. It deserves to be heard and seen by all. Oh, that's sweet. Yes. Nice. So okay. there's your gratitude letter, right? Yeah, that makes right me feel chat. good. I feel better so already. <laughs> there you go. It works. So did anyone have any more questions? Um, in work, oh, here's one from Gavin. It says, in work meetings, does your staff practice any gratitude exercises or fun team building activities to supplement standard round robin information updates from individual staff? Well, you know, that's a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll a ask them, uh, you know, what went well yesterday? Uh, did you have any positive um, customer experiences that you'd like to talk about? So it kind of, it kind of helps, I guess, prime the the pump for positivity. And when I first started doing that, staff were like, eh, what's he talking about? You know, but I think, you know, people start to, they, they know that we're going to, we're going to talk about these sort of things. So I think they start to seek out opportunities for, for these things. And, you know, what, what were some of the positive, someone's, he might call on me and ask me, what were some positive experiences that you had? What went well yesterday? So I'm going to seek those out. So it kind of retrains your brain to seek out, you know, positive, positive experiences as opposed to the other kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that kind of thing helps, you know, the what went well, I think is great, as well as um, talking about positive customer interactions is, is great. Uh, you know, something else is, um, you know, as far as gratitude, you can you can pick some kind of object and, uh, and you can hand it off. So it might be like a, an elephant or something like that. And, you know, it's kind of like, oh, what did you do to get the elephants? Talk about it. Oh, I did this. So not only are you recognizing somebody, but it's a way to um, institute best practices. Oh, I did this. So it, it kind of works in two different ways. So that, I like that as well. Oh, interesting. So that people have to ask, why did you get this? Yeah. What, how'd, you, how'd you get that? And then they say, they say, oh, I did this. And anybody can hand it off. It's not like a, a supervisor. It can be just any coworker. You know, you see somebody doing something awesome and you can, you can pass it on. Okay. Fantastic. And I love the idea of your 10-5 way. That's kind of yeah. fun. Yeah. It is. That. Okay. Um, pretty cool. So we're getting close to 10 o'clock. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions if they want to or get back to work after 10 when we're all over here. I noticed that um, someone said they had six people joining in a cohort for viewing. So if you could let us know about that too, we'd really appreciate it. So we have an idea of how many are attending. Um, and thank you so much, David. This has been just a great presentation. Oh, it was my pleasure. It's it's always yeah. fun to talk about kindness and gratitude. It's definitely a fun topic. Yes. No doubt. Yes. So it has something for us to work on during the holiday season, right? That sounds promising. Yeah, don't worry about buying the gifts so much. Just worry about uh, just being, know, being kind. Yeah, exactly. 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 So I also want to thank those of you who took time to attend today. And please remember to take the short, there's just a four question survey at the end that really helps us um, with our annual report and funding. And like I said, this webinar, it'll be posted to the Washington State Library training page later today. And that will include the handouts that David so kindly shared. And we'll have those over so you can look at the handouts and redo the webinar if you'd like to. Um, and you can share, go feel free to share the webinars with coworkers or anyone else um, that you feel would benefit from hearing about kindness and gratitudes. And want to thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day.